Ian Elliott, always, always a pleasure to talk to you by video because you have the beautiful background setting of your garden and some people's fields, I'm assuming that's what it is. How are you doing, mate? Very, very good, thank you. Good morning. Yeah, I'm just showing <laughs> off other people's fields to make out like we've got a big garden. <laughs> <laughs> so people, uh, before this, you know, there's been an intro explaining your key, your key positions that you've held and hold in terms of leadership. Tell me, noting the story, the conversation that we had in the HR podcast and the incredible journey you've been on, what of all your leadership roles and your positions that you've held, what's been, what is your most memorable one? There's a lot of, there's a lot of good memories going way back. Uh, but what's really nice about where we are now with Elliot Brown is that you've got all of that hindsight sitting behind you. So you can do things with kind of greater clarity and when you start out to create a brand there's a lot of things you've got to get right and when you and when they all come together it feels amazing and delivering our first issued watch to the british military was probably the proudest moment of my life just unbelievable feeling to have gone through all of that quite difficult process of purchasing and development and all of that. It's not easy selling to the military, but in terms of, it's, I suppose it's not really a leadership thing, is it? It's more of an achievement thing. But to me, the two go kind of hand in hand. I don't see myself as a, as a leader, really. I just see myself as a, someone who works hard and tries to achieve things. Yeah, this, I mean, there's an element, there's a huge element of pride that comes into being uh, one, a part of an organisation that, I mean, for you, that seminal moment where you've got a, you know, a, a watch that you make or that Elliot Brown makes that is on issue to the military and being part of that team. But also the, 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 the pride must be magnified in the fact that you are, whether you like it or not, Ian, you know, what, one of the leading members of, of the company. Yeah, I thought... <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a common theme this is you know in the other interviews i've been doing for the leader mind series there's a common theme kind of about which i and it is that of the importance of learning you you mentioned it just just there i was expecting you to say you know uh being a co-founder and being one of the heads of the ship that was animal you know back in the day i was expect expecting you to say that as your most memorable, memorable leadership position. I think because, man, it was so, it, it was such a beast of a company and, and also so much turbulence involved in it and, su and such learning. And actually it's not, it's the, it's the Elliot Brown, which is, it surprises me. Of, of all the positions you've held then, what has been your most, your most memorable, memorable mistake? What has stuck with you? Oh, that, that definitely goes back to animal days. So, so plucky Brits as we are, uh, we, we decided we were going to go and conquer America. And we went in fairly low key. Uh, one of our guys, I think we spoke about it in the HR um, podcast. One of our guys moved there naturally, said, could he take the brand there? Uh, we, we'd been going to shows there for four or five years. But we knew the market pretty well. We knew what the brands were doing. Um, and we just didn't understand how the American psyche works. We didn't get it at all, in fact. And the longer we were there, the worse it seemed to get. And we spent so much money trying to make it work, chasing our tails, reinventing ourselves. When if we just stuck to what we went there with we'd have probably succeeded but we were impatient because it didn't happen as quickly as it happened in the uk and our resources were spread too thinly and we yeah we made tons of mistakes and in the end that that caused the change in our uh gearing at the bank uh which caused us to go and have to raise money and ultimately sell the business and so yeah that was a pretty big mistake 
So was one of the learning points in there that you thought you understood, so, sorry, that um, don't, is that you shouldn't have, because you had knowledge and experience of being there and you thought you knew it, is there, is the takeaway from that then that you, there needs to be, a, always needs to be a formal market analysis when you're going to look and, and you know, um, expand different areas? See, I think formal analysis would have been, would have told us to do exactly what we did. But the, the thing we underestimated was the difference in character of a different race of people. And I've seen it in other in other markets as well, where we when we expanded animal into other international markets. You know, you go to France, the French think differently to us. You go to Germany, they think differently to us. You go to Belgium, they think differently to us. And every every nationality seems to have its own um, I don't know, its own character, its own reason for buying or wanting or or desiring something they seem to be different buttons that you have to press uh, compared with the uk and we just didn't understand what they were why did you so when you when you went there with the initial product why did you end up um introducing other products because you mentioned that when you were talking about it you should have stuck with what you had as opposed to introduce new things what can you elaborate on that part of it I think everybody got frustrated that the initial sales weren't as strong as we hoped. And it was just because the brand was new. Uh, it wasn't because the product was wrong. Uh, we got impatient and we thought, no, OK, the market, we, we lost confidence. So we started to try and think about other things that were going to work better and put everything into doing that. And it just made it worse. We got it wrong again. And we, we ended up just chasing our tails. We did two or three iterations of product, particularly watches. Um, in we, thinking we were, what we were doing was watering down what we'd gone there with in the first place. We just yeah, weren't well, patient enough. So you, you would have, I mean, in hindsight, if you'd gone back and doing something differently, we just didn't start, how, I mean, how long did you spend on the initial product out there, just out of interest? Months, years, weeks? Oh, probably a year. Yeah, probably a year. But what we underestimated was the size of the market, the time it takes to penetrate the market, the time it takes to to generate enough kind of gravitas in the brand for people to desire it and want it. And yeah, we 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 just didn't didn't get that right at all. We underestimated every part of it. So how how can you how can you in terms of the the cultural yeah, we're talking about the different cultures, really, aren't aren't we? And how and how yeah, and how they impact your business. How can how can you understand the, how can you understand those cultures then better when you're moving from the UK to go and sell in another area, in another part of the world? What's the best approach to take to understand to get into the nitty gritty and understand those cultures? Because you mentioned when we spoke on the HR podcast, you did mention that I think you mentioned that you you, you regretted not hiring enough of the people in America, enough Americans? Completely. I mean, uh, we, we had this mentality of hiring people that we, we totally got on with and that we liked. But we naturally gravitated towards Brits. We had, we had American people in the office, but we didn't have them in, in, in key roles. We had Brits in the key roles. And in hindsight, that was the mistake. We should have had American people um, who really understood their own psyche, their own market, their own emotion, you know, their own market emotions and and so on. And I think that would be, if I, if I was to go to America again, I'd 100% do that. What, what's more important when we're talking about staff and talking about clients, customers, consumers, what's more important? Um, and they're both, they're both, a relationship with your clients is important and a relationship with your staff is important. But what, what for you is, uh, can have a bigger impact, a, neg a bigger negative impact in the business? A poor relationship with the people you employ or, the poor, or a poor relationship with the customers? The people you employ, I'd say, comes first because if you get that right, you create this, this ball of energy that everybody wants a bit of. And if you get it wrong, you water that ball of energy down and it, the enthusiasm there, the emotional impact, sort of investment isn't there from the people that are working with you. And and so the passion in what they're, when they talk to somebody about your business, your product, 
whether it's a conversation to a customer or a you know a trade customer or a magazine or whoever it is if there isn't a passion then it's watered down and it's kind of hollow so i think if you get the, the, the people who understand and are passionate and you treat them properly and give them the, the trust to to run with your ideas then you'll never get a more passionate bunch of people and that i think is what translates into successful customers you i think um i think you've got from i've you know, i've met i've met the the, uh, the people at elliot brown down at the office and it seems to me like you, you've got that you struck like chord there how 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 will you manage that as the company grows how you manage that relationship with the staff because as, as a company grows i mean you probably saw this as animal and other positions to your help as the company grows bigger inevitably you as a leader get further away from the the people on the sharp end there's there's more managers in between there's there's more you know uh there's more people in between you and the, on the sharp end how can you manage that as it goes forward and grows and maintain that emotional investment from the staff into the business um to give you some idea of our, our kind of employment uh, strategy we don't we don't really go too much on a cv we go more on what was that conversation like what did we feel did we get the right vibe and if your gut says no then say no you have to go with your gut you have to employ the right person if you've got the right person you can teach them everything they need to know as long as they've got the base and as long as they've got you know a certain amount of experience that um that they bring to the table and try and employ people better that better than you at what they do better than us at what they do so we're always upskilling the business each time we employ somebody and you have to go through that kind of pain of working you know ridiculous hours to do two jobs until you've got enough uh, cash and resources to employ the person you want to you want to bring in to take some of that off you um, so yeah i would always employ on the on the character and the person rather than the, the cv yeah i'd be inclined to agree with that i think up to up to the stage i think there's, there's times where you need, absolutely need the professional qualifications it's the proof of learning you know in uh for smes engineers and stuff like that but and then again arguably not it's a, it's an interesting one i think actually it, in, in many industries that the, the the trend seems to be maybe moving away from the emphasis on a CV with all the right information on and all the right experience and all the right qualifications and degrees to, uh, as you said, the, the, the personal, you know, the, the personal feeling on it. What are the peop- the person's values, how, what's their integrity like? Um, what have they got? Go on. You don't get me wrong. A CV is important, right? We all, we all read the CV and you can get an enormous amount of character from a CV. I remember once um, when we had the design agency, someone sent us in a beautifully made waxed carton of badger milk. And obviously <laughs> there's no such thing as badger milk, right? But that was their CV. And it was just, it was just hilarious. And we wanted to employ that person so badly because they just had it, right? They just got it, didn't they? We were a design agency and they sent us a carton of badger milk. What? I mean, brilliant. <laughs> Someone else, I remember uh, a French girl um, sent us a, a CV and it was, she'd written it on a beautiful brown paper with a, um, a lovely uh, ink pen and she tied it up with a bit of string and, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the usual CV and you want to meet someone who makes you intrigued, don't you? I think that's I think they've got some character and they've got some balls to to do that and to not follow the herd they've got some individuality and it, of course it depends on the role you're employing for right I've, I've all of the things I've ever done have been quite creative so you're naturally looking for people with that that sort of flair and an imagination um, you know if you were if you were employing a I don't know a chemist or a, or, or someone who's specializing in tax accountancy for example then that's not so important and, and their previous experience and their achievements are going to be way way more important but i'm quite lucky in that what we do most of what we need is just the right person 
Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, looking at just from a sort of a job hunting, looking for employment perspective, I, I've, it's advice I've I've given to ex-military colleagues over the years as I've been out and they're getting out. And I've just got a bit more experience with it. Is that when you apply for a role, it, it's probably going to be a, a hell of a lot of other people applying for the same role with very, very similar qualifications. And, and, and you have to, you've got to make yourself stand out. You've got to make yourself different. And how do you do that? Now, if you're applying for a job, as, for example, a project manager, then maybe sending a, 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 a tub of badger milk isn't going to cut the mustard. But there's other ways. You, you've got to innovate and find a way to make you stick in the mind of the person who's going to be, you know, it could be the initial person doing the CV set. It could be the person who's going to decide who goes on to the second phase. And it, you've you got to think outside the box because they're going to read the CV. And sometimes you can't you can't amend your CV. You can't do something in your CV unless you're going to lie. To make it stick in their mind, you have to find other ways. Pick up the phone, walk into the office, and get them on LinkedIn, get them on Skype, you know. Um, yeah, we've gone, <laughs> gone off track slightly. I mean, yeah, <laughs> you're, a, you're a guy, right, who's got a... You, you've got a huge amount of value in what you do in your personal life. You're an outdoors person. You love outdoor sports. I mean, that's where the seeds of animal were sown, right? And, uh, and you carry that on now. And, uh, and you're a family man. What, what aspect of your personal life, your family life, has, the, has a, the biggest negative impact on your professional life? And how do you manage that relationship between your family and what you want to do outside of work and work? I think I have probably the most understanding wife in the world. <laughs> no. Some businesses you can you can have an idea and it takes off and it's a massive success and it doesn't require every hour of your day. When you're building a brand, it requires every hour of the day. It's a relentless slog to keep to keep focused on the original thing you set out to achieve and not deviate. And you've got to just be bloody minded. You've got to get up every day like it's the first day, go hard, go long if it takes long hours. And in, somewhere in between that, try and get a balance between your personal life, your family life and the sports you enjoy. And it inevitably means you know, long hours. And um, But it's... You know, we're pretty lucky. We we work we work 15 minutes away from home, so we're not we haven't got an hour hour and a half commute to and from work. So, you know, I can work from sort of half seven, quarter to eight in the morning till six at night, but I still have a reasonable amount of family time. So it's not as bad as it could be. And we get out and we do, you know we do we we do try really really hard not to work at weekends, so we have a balance and we can get out on the water and get out on the bikes and travel and visit people and you know do those things you, but, you mentioned sorry but yeah having having someone who understands how hard you have to work and also how much emotional energy you need to put in while you're there because you know you're not just doing one simple thing all day long you're you're jumping from you know one minute it's web stats the next minute it's sketching a product development the next minute it's a trademark application the next it's a customer query or a problem or it's a trying to source something that you've never sourced before or you know the variety of stuff is mentally tiring definitely you mentioned branding just now building the brand can you if you don't mind can you elaborate on what what you mean by building a brand and and, and what a brand is okay and the reason i ask is um it's a difficult i think it's a difficult concept to understand what you mean by building a brand because some people would think well that's choosing the company name, it's the colour schemes, it's the logo, and it's sort of the, deciding what your, your target market's going to target market's going to be. Can you elaborate on that build, the building a brand aspect for me, if you don't mind? Wow, that's a big question. We haven't, we um, haven't got all day. No, okay, so um, it's not about a logo. All right, that's just part of it. It's a really, really big recipe. And if one bit of it, you miss the salt out, it's going to taste shit. That's kind of like a brand, right? And every brand's got a different recipe. And part of that recipe is product, part of it's your, your persona, part of it's how many things you make or do. For us, it's doing one thing and doing it really, really well, which is making 
just making really tough, durable watches. And with that focus, it's then quite easy to set out your stall. What, what, if you want to be the best at making durable watches, how do you create desire? How do you make that something that people want to buy into? So we've naturally gravitated towards uh, people who have done amazing things and they become our ambassadors, uh, associations with other bodies, um, the military project, military watches. They're all things that I think set you, set you up in, in the world we exist in, in watches, to create a bit of desire. And the more you do, the more you desire you create. And then you've got to tell everybody about it. So that this recipe is, is a really, really uh, difficult thing to get right. But if you've got the right people and you've got the right focus and you're driven enough to just keep going, because a lot of people get bored of one thing. They get bored of, oh, I've made a watch. Now what can we go and make? Let's make shoes. Let's make belts. Let's make hats. Let's make, you know, clothing. And that would be the easiest thing in the world to go and do that. But it would, we'd spread our effort and we'd stop being so desirable, I think. And I think lots of brands make that mistake. Animal made that mistake. You know, other other big surfing brands make that mistake, particularly when they put their logos on cars and things like that. You know, you see, see a, I don't know, uh, you used to see an animal Mitsubishi truck or a, a Quicksilver Renault or, a, you know, and you just think, oh, come on. It's got nothing to do with cars, you dickheads. <laughs> so, so staying, staying really, really, really focused on the thing you do best are doing it better than anybody else, creating that unique kind of position. You know, who'd have thought we could, we could start a watch business and compete against Swiss giants in a recession, in pool, you know. But, but if you just keep at it and you keep doing the right things, saying the right things, making the right stuff, looking after customers well, getting that whole recipe you know, that every single part of that recipe has to be good. If your customer experience is bad, they'll complain, they'll talk. Today, you know, it's so much easier to talk harshly about something than it was 20 years ago because there's so many online channels and one, one bad thing, you, you're history, right? So you've got to get it right all the time. And uh, I'd say that's the biggest thing to create a brand is to, is to consider all the, all, the, all the ingredients in your recipe and just stick to it. Hmm. Yeah, you put it well. I, uh, I was, I was listening intently. Then I was listening intently. I'm going to go back over this and, and make <laughs> <Sorry>. notes. <laughs> I'm conscious of the time. Tell me, Ian, what is the most important quality of a successful and successful being the key word here? Yeah, the important quality of a successful leader, in your humble opinion. think one, one quality it's just you it, or it can be more if you if you want go for it I'd say drive humility confidence if you're unconfident people don't believe you if you're not driven people don't want to kind of follow you and come along for the ride if you haven't got humility it's very difficult to work with people and get emotional involvement from your from your people that you work with what do you mean by um, humility what do you mean by humility being understanding being emotionally sensitive to to others not being um too too demanding but being understanding setting setting parameters out and then Trusting people as well. I think trust is a massive thing. Every business I've ever had, I've always said, look, this 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 whole this whole thing is based on trust. If we lose, if, if you lose our trust, that's it, you're done. Um, so trust is the other the other sort of key thing I think as well. But that's giving trust in your people. So in terms of leadership, that's just a style. It's not. That, that's how I think. That's how I work, and, and how Alex works as well with me. So it's. It's, it's, it's quite unique to our position, I think. I don't think it's necessarily to be a successful prime minister or to be a successful 
you know, blue chip company chairman um, might require some different things. But I, I certainly think that if you're a good listener, um, then and, and you're com and if you're confident enough to employ people better than you as well, you know, I don't see myself as a as a leader really. I just see myself as someone who's driven and and has passion for what I do. That's a really interesting point there, actually. Yeah, having the confidence to employ people who are better than you. Flipping heck. I, I mean, that can be a that can be a difficult pill to swallow, a diff difficult realization for people, I think, because uh, because inevitably the people who are, are leaders, successful leaders of big or small organizations, they're already driven. They got they probably got a huge amount of confidence in themselves, and they think they're better than most. And then and then they try, and and they probably fought tooth and nail to get where they are, you know. And so. Yeah, to, to, to see value in employing people that are better than you. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, definitely. Ian, it's uh, the time's up, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you again. Can you um can you remind me Ian uh, the Elliot Brown website? Yeah, of course. It's elliotbrownwatches.com. <laughs> Easy peasy. Anything else you want to mention before we cut it off? I just want to say how enjoyable it is to talk to you here. It's it's really good fun, you know. This is this is just it's not hard work, is it? It's great. Well, that's because I'm not I'm not that intelligent. So I'm learning all the time. I'm just, I'm just a good listener. <laughs> 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 now it's been good. I really, really, generally enjoyed talking to you again, mate. I, I learned a lot. How much can you learn in 25 minutes? I learned a lot there. Cool. So, um, mate, I'll see you again soon. Thank you, Ian. Really enjoyed it. Cheers, you.